Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. Here we are for another episode of the Soul Seeker podcast. I am so stoked to be sitting down with Kate Perkovic, and we met through George Bryan at his event. But before we dive into the pod, as always, let's just ground with a few breaths. So for Kate and I, we'll close our eyes. Listeners, if you're driving, obviously don't close your eyes, but you can breathe with us. No matter what you're doing, you can always breathe with us. So if you're in a place to sit down and close down the eyes, I invite you to shift into the inner world and just beginning to feel your feet on the floor, sitting straight up broadening the chest and through the nose letting the belly expand as you inhale all the way up sipping in a bit more at the top and through the mouth sighing it out inhaling up sipping in a bit more at the top holding the breath Maybe rolling the eyes up and audible sigh, letting it go. And one last one, biggest inhale yet, really letting the belly expand as you bring that breath all the way up. Sipping in a bit more, sipping a bit more air. Hold the breath, roll up the eyes, applying a root lock here. And exhale. You're flickering the eyes back open. And here we are. Kate, welcome to the Soul Seeker Pod. So stoked to have you here. I am so psyched to be here. And I will just say that is such a centering moment to start a podcast. Usually when people go into stuff like this, they like hit the ground running and they just start hammering you with questions. And I feel a whole nice level of calm through my entire body right now. So that was a beautiful way to start. Oh, thanks for that. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. You know, a lot of times with podcasts, I feel like it's just like boom, 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 boom. And it's like, whoa, we are on just two different energies right now. So it's just a really good way of getting resonance. And you know, since uh, we will be diving into your journey and everything, but I'll share this with you because you'll get a kick out of this. And I know the listeners will as well. My clients already know about it, but it's called the WIFLE. Have you heard of the acronym WIFLE? No. No. So I learned this back in like, I don't know, 2012 or 2013 uh, conference, but the acronym and most people don't aren't familiar with it. It stands for what I feel like expressing. So the idea is anytime you're starting a, mo- a meeting, instead of just doing that informal, like, hey, how you doing? Like a little chit chat and what's going on. It's like actually creating the space for like what's going on in your life. You don't have to share, but here's a 30 to 90 second opportunity to share. And the idea is like, 
if maybe something happened in the morning, something with the kids or your dog or just something went wrong just right before this, we try just mask up and put on that face like everything's good, but energetically we can kind of feel something is off. So just by like getting that off our chest allows other people to be like, oh, okay, that's what's going on with Sam right now. Got it. And then it just starts to soften everything where we're able to see the humanness in one another. So it's a cool little thing. Which is honestly nice because the amount of people you will ask, even myself included, I think back to it now as you're saying that, who will say, hey, how's your day going? And you're like, I'm great, thanks. And underneath you're like, it has been a morning or it's been a week, it's been a month, like whatever it may be. And we just kind of go through the motions of it. So I love that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a good one. And I mean, you know, I still do the, hey, how's it going? And everything too, right? Like we have to constantly be like okay wiffle and that's why i typically do it like with my clients that know it you know in the inside but anyways that aside guys if if that is intriguing to you i would definitely invite you to bring that into your meetings or even just your family dynamics and relationships now kate i am really excited to be here with you you're a marketing genius just a marketing what do you uh i don't want to say wizard so would that be <laughs> which then <laughs> which is our good things i'll take marketing witch that's okay i'll take that. yeah that's a good thing yeah yeah, yeah. sweet well I, w I met you through Georgia, uh, Georgia, Brian, G <laughs> mind of George, George Bryant. I am full of combining words today. I was on a podcast earlier where I meant to say like emotionally and binge eating, and it came out a mingly eating <laughs> the combination of emotional and binge. So that said, yeah, I met Kate at George Bryant's uh, event in Montana, which was amazing. And Kate led a session on marketing and then was gracious enough to do a breakdown with me. But that wasn't always your world. Kind of walk us through how you went from being in the restaurant business as a waitress to uh, coaching, marketing, and where you're at now. Yeah, I mean... Um... I feel like the story could probably be four episodes in itself if we really want to unpack it, but the high, the high level of it really being in the slogan, I guess, that you're going to usually hear is kind of like from waitress to, to business. And six years ago, um, you know, like many people I saw online that people were starting online businesses and I had seen the laptop lifestyle and the fact you get to work from your phone and work from the beach and drink Mai Tais on a Tuesday. And I was like, that kind of seems like a life that I could get with. And, uh, I went to a conference actually because I followed an influencer and this influencer had been going to an event in Toronto. And so I was like, I'm going to go to that and see if maybe at that event, it kind of gives me some spark of clarity for this. And at the time um, I'd been working out a lot and like I was going to the gym pretty frequently. And so fitness was a, a decent part of my life at that time. And this was a conference for fitness businesses that wanted to kind of grow online. And so I went to that event and the event was amazing. And I started to be around people who were making hundred thousand dollar a month seem like the norm um, and having conversations about 20 K days. And I was like, okay, I don't understand what's happening. Um, it felt like it was a scheme. There's gotta be something going on here because I had always until that point been told that like six figures a year was a really good income. And like, that was something that was pretty standard, like of the main thing to go for, to look to achieve. And so when I started to surround myself with other people who were really blowing my mind when it came to what was possible, I kind of couldn't unsee. I had this awareness of what was possible. And so then it started to kind of eat me alive. I was like, okay, like I have to explore this. And so at any event, if you guys have gone to events, they often usually, not always, but usually will have an opportunity to join some kind of extension of that experience. So like coaching or continuing membership or something like that. And so they presented an opportunity and it was like a $20,000 mastermind. And this was, I, I was still paycheck to paycheck. So like I didn't have $20,000. Uh, but my partner actually at the time had said, listen, like if this is something we want to do, like I will support us and try to fi figuring out the resources here. And so at the time we started the business and we made the first payment of many payments toward that mastermind and kind of got the ball rolling. And so I started to get into it and I started to sign clients in the fitness thing. And I'm going to be really honest with you. I love brownies and wine way too much to be in the fitness space. It's just mm -hmm. not my natural operating system. Together, uh, brownies and wine together. Yeah, yeah sometimes would that, actually. Would that be white wine then? Not red, right? Yeah, white, white wine. Yeah, yeah. Just just check in there because I, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I feel like red wine and brownies wouldn't go together. But I don't really drink white wine, but it's a little bit sweeter. So that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Sam, recommendations on <laughs> I gotcha. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I just felt like the fitness thing wasn't for me. And I was kind of searching for something else. And at the time, the mentor actually had seen me that I was working with, had seen what I was doing with my fitness business and had said, listen, like, I'd love to talk to you about maybe mentoring other people in the program to do the same. And so very quickly, me having my own business turned into me coaching other people in fitness. And in that team, I had the opportunity to take on a sales closer role. And they had someone that wasn't able to come in for sales. So I was like, you know, I'm gonna hop on the phone and see what I can do. And I started loving closing for sales because I had gone to school for social work. So I was like, I can talk to people. This is just people with a paycheck at the end. Like I can do this. Um, so went in, started doing high ticket closing and started closing, you know, consistently at 20 and 30 K packages. And I really loved that. But then I was part of a team where, you know, the values and the dynamic weren't really aligning with me. And I kind of was looking for something else. And that's what had me desire to be like, okay, I'm going to go start and do this on my own. So I had taken all the knowledge of the fitness business and being inside this other multiple seven figure business and being a closer and kind of took all that awareness and started coaching women. And so basically within 18 months of starting the business, um, I hit the ground running and I was like, we're going to press go on this. And it scaled really quickly. And so six years later, we're still doing the same offers and still just kind of keeping with the impact and trying to grow the message and grow the brand um, day by day. But I know we, even when we were chatting in person, like it's, it's been a journey in the sense of a lot of like highs, a lot of lows as well. Um, I definitely don't always want it to be the, the highlight reel of how much it's made or how many followers or any of those things. Um, because I think there's been a lot of learning lessons that have had to happen in order for a lot of those highlights to happen, um, mm -hmm. which is why I so appreciated hearing about the work that you do, because a lot of the modalities that you talk about, you talked about work-life balance and a lot of that resonated with me because it was something that in this journey, I lost so frequently because I really associated hustle or pushing and kind of, um, you know, kind of ignoring, frankly, tuning in. Um, as one of the ways to grow. And it's interesting now because having an appreciation for what you do and having done work in it myself as a practice, I've realized the impact of how much really like the growth is a matter of tuning in, not tuning out. Mm. That's gold right there. Growth is tuning in, not tuning out. I love that. So with the the sort of coaching, what is the sort of coaching that you do with women? I imagine it's evolved over the six years, but how, what does it look like? Yeah. So really for us, we specifically focus on scaling women. So usually anyone who's making about six figures in their business and upward. Um, and so for us, we focus really heavily on organic marketing in order to do that. And really just truthfully considering all of the things that women have to go through in building a business, because it, I think there's kind of this divide in a way, like people see there's business in the way that it's done. And there's the one way of doing it. And then there's another train of thought, which is women's business and men's business. And we kind of come from the mindset of business is business. Like everyone deserves the same strategies. Um, but the way in which you approach them may be different. So for example, like women having to go on mat leave and take X amount of time off um, to have a family is just a reality that women have to deal with. But it doesn't necessarily mean that certain um, business strategies have considered that in the way that they're executed. And so for us, we kind of look at the duality of like bringing real, tangible, effective strategies to women, but also considering, you know, the things that are going to be happening in their life um, as part of how they integrate that. Okay. And, but primarily like kind of marketing based, would you say? Yeah, definitely marketing and sales based. Yeah. So yeah, you mentioned uh, your background with sales. Uh, you must just have like a knack for marketing then I would take, right? Yeah. So I did... Uh, I originally thought I was going to go into social work and then I realized the intensity of that work. And I realized that the money that was in that type of industry, if you wanted to grow. Um, and so I really took truthfully, like the, the conversational type of aspects of social work and then integrated that into sales and high ticket sales is something I love because I love being able to go like really deep with people, which I think is possible in the high ticket space to really have like massive deep impact. Um, but the marketing actually came from someone recommending that I do kind of like the mass messaging sales. So like messaging like 75 people and seeing how many people buy was a numbers game. Uh, and it just felt gross to me. Like I was like, I have no desire to do this. Um, and so I was like, what if I could just like be a magnet and they come to me? And so that's when I really started to play with the content side of things and the marketing side. Um, and once I sunk my teeth into that, it basically from year one until now has only been organic marketing. So we've never done ads. We've never done any other type other than just social. 
So what's the secret? Because I I I mess I mentioned this a lot at the event. I was using the word promoting, and I, you reframed it to what was the word you reframed it to? Well, you were talking about selling. And oh, so okay, maybe that was I it. Know, I don't know if I want to be selling every day, and that's something that a lot of businesses say because people usually associate selling or quote unquote pitching your services as a negative thing. And the way that I think about it, and this got passed on from a previous mentor to me was like, when you have like for you and your coaching and what you do for people and the way that you change their life, like you, each one of us has something in us that's eating us alive as a problem. And so if you think about that, like a cancer in you, and yet you you with your coaching have the solution to that, you have the prescription that could take away the symptoms and take away the pain but then you don't tell anyone that you have it and you hold it close to the chest and never share it with anybody. To me, it's looking at really, really when we think about that, how selfish that is. And so the way that I think about quote unquote promoting or selling um, is really a matter of making people aware and thinking about it as an invitation more than persuasion. And so yeah. that's really how I look at marketing is like, I'm just constantly inviting people. And if you're not someone who resonates with what I'm saying, that's actually good because it means whatever I'm talking about probably isn't a good fit to help you with your specific um, illness or quote unquote problem that you're experiencing. My prescription doesn't fit for that. And so we often talk a lot about what people must be going through in our marketing so that they can see, hey, those are the symptoms I have. I'm going to listen to her diagnosis and maybe she has a prescription for me. Um, and so I really think about, you know, making sales from social as an aspect of just constantly inviting people into your world. Yeah, I really want to highlight that too. For, for you guys listening that are either in the midst of a career transition or you have your own business. And I, I know a lot of people in my field that just kind of feel weird about promoting and selling and pitching and all these different things, right? What Kate just said about inviting at the event, I heard you say a few times, I'm inviting you to my party. Like you're, I mean, I'm saying you're invited to come to my party. If you don't want to come, that's cool, but you're invited. And yeah. I love that. That's such a great reframe. Well, even when it comes to sales, like I use the party analogy because a lot of people will also say like, why are people not running to me with wanting to spend money and like banging down my door saying, how do I pay you? And like, does that happen? Is that possible? Absolutely. The thing that I also look at though, is like, if you're at a party and you're standing in the corner and you're like, I don't understand why no one's coming up to talk, talk to me. It's not really a mystery. Like go work the room, go connect right. with people. And it's not to say that the first time you connect, you should, should be selling them. But I think the aspect of kind of like, quote unquote, working the room or working your platform is really a matter of like, go and create connections, go and create relationships. Because when you do that, you're planting seeds. And so also connected to sales is oftentimes a lot of businesses plant seeds. They look back two seconds later and they're like, where's the crop? And I'm like, you need to wait because you just planted the seed. So I think it's also like it's relationships and it's, you know, not hiding and expecting them all to come to you and wondering why they're not reaching out. Um, because truthfully, when it comes to sales, to have someone walk up to you and say, hey, I want to buy your services takes a lot out of a person to do that. And so the invitation is also a way to help people who are not quite at that stage of confidence to have a really easy way to connect with you if they don't feel like walking up to you saying, take my money is where they're at yet in their mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want to go back because I, I kind of changed the, the subject, but I asked you what the secret is and you, you already said the secret, it's being a magnet and attracting. So can you expand on that a little bit more? Well, I think attracting in marketing is a couple things. I think one is definitely values because I think a lot of people think about bringing in ideal people is just talking to pain. And one of the things that we really push to is like, yes, you can do pain point marketing and you can do dream marketing, but a lot of the reason you're going to buy into someone is based off of who they are and what they stand for. And so I think one of the core things you have to know is like, what are your beliefs? What are the principles that you live by? And how can someone get bought into that? Because then it's less about the point you're talking about and more about kind of giving bumper lanes for people to fall within. So the example I give to clients is if you think about like the commandments, when we get bought into the religion and we're following the commandments, we're not having to go through all the tactical situations of what that commandment looks like. We just say, hey, if you resonate with these commandments, you probably resonate with what we stand for. 
Well, the same thing is true when it comes to marketing. You need to have your inner beliefs or values that your community needs to kind of be on the same page with. And I think the other thing that's really important, honestly, is the energy that you bring. We talk about this in brand as well when it comes to tone and every single brand that you consume makes you feel something. They either make you feel empowered. They're that kick in the butt that you kind of look forward to because they're so direct and spicy with you. They might be the soft landing place that you feel like validated and heard. And it's kind of like a soft shoulder to lean on. And so that feeling is also something you want to get clarity on, because if you are someone who's wanting to brand as the soft place, and then you shift your messaging to being very, very spicy, you've turned away the essence of why people came to you. And so I think it really to be a true magnet in marketing is not actually about outward what you're promoting as, as much as the number one focus to start. It's really getting clarity of who the heck are you before you ever think about putting out a post. Because if you don't have that clarity, you kind of just machine gun a bunch of different messages and tones and values. And you're like, I just don't understand. Why do I not have community? Why are people not resonating with what I'm saying? And it's because really you don't have clarity of what you're saying. So until you know what you're saying and why you're saying it, they're not going to catch on to the pattern that you're putting out. Because you're only talking to yourself anyways, right? Yeah. A lot of marketing is self -serving, self serving, self serving. Can you unpack that for someone that might be listening be like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, well, marketing being self-serving really means that what you're creating is of interest to you and is based off your level of awareness. So if I am at a stage in business where I have a totally different level of awareness of different problems, what they look like, different solutions, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person who's consuming me also has that level of awareness. So when I'm marketing to them, it may completely just go right over their head because they don't even realize that it's their problem. And so the big issue that a lot of people have when it comes to marketing is they're almost like marketing to themselves. But the issue with most people is that you're not at the same stage as your consumer. And so because of that, a lot of your messaging doesn't resonate for them. So even though you may, for some people, they are in the past, they used to be their consumer. You have to constantly check yourself to say, okay, if I know this, do they know this? Do they have this experience? Do they have this awareness? Do they have this knowledge? Because if they don't, it means when you put out that messaging, they're not going to resonate with it. So one of the things we look at with people going into messaging is really looking at like symptoms and getting, do you understand the clarity of how someone's problem shows up in their world, not in yours? So let's just say stress is something that I'm trying to market as a core problem. Well, I might know how stress shows up in my life, but does that mean that that's how it's showing up in my ideal client's life? And it might be for me that, you know, stress is something where I feel like I get frustrated and how I deal with that is I go and I do an ice bath because I'm a weirdo like that, but that doesn't, necess yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean. And for most of my audience, if I'm going to be honest, most of the women in my world don't immediately jump into a bath when they feel stressed because they haven't had the journey or the awareness to know about a pattern interrupt. They don't know Wait, how to pause right there though. Do you think that that is actually a good thing because it inspires and motivates them? It is. If you tie it back to the impact. So if I was going to share in marketing, which I actually do, like we have people in my circle joke about how much I love bathtubs. Um, when I, have a stressful moment, one of the first things that I do is I get into water of some kind. So like hot water, cold water, something to reset my state. And if I'm going to market that, I have to say, here's what I do. And most importantly, here's why you need to care about this. Because it's not just about the bath. It's about the bath being a byproduct of me learning in my business that when I was stressed, I had to pattern interrupt and reshift my physical state before I solved a problem. So I say for you, it might look like this, 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 but what I'm doing is I'm tying what I'm doing and who I'm embodying to why should they care? Because otherwise what ends up happening in marketing is, Hey, look at me, how cool I am that I do ice baths. And I'm sure all of you guys have seen those people on social media yeah. and it's great to see how tough you are, but it's like, but why does the audience care about that? Because Sarah at home is feeling so stressed today and it's been since this morning at 7 a.m. And now it's 7 p.m. And she still has that knot in her gut that she can't shake. And if she had actually understood pattern interrupts and resetting her nervous system like I do, she'd be at 2 p.m. a completely different person and have crushed the second half of her day. 
And so it's really just giving insight and awareness to if you're going to embody and say something, asking yourself that question with everything that you post of why should someone care about this, i.e. how does it impact them in a positive way? Or what are the implications to them if they don't know this information? Mm, what are the implications to them if they don't know this information? What are the implications if they don't know? So could you say that another way? Because I get it, but it's it's a hard one. It's a mouthful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So to simplify, impact in anything you're going to talk about is if I was to understand again, back to our example, if I was going to understand how to self-regulate and resetting my nervous system, what positive things could happen in my life if I was to know how to do that? Well, when you're stressed, this would happen. And when you are freaking out in business, you wouldn't have a reaction decision to something because you'd actually know how to reset your state, right? So you're showing all the positive things that could happen. Implications are basically taking the exact same thing, but speaking to it in a negative lens. And that's because some people in marketing are resonating and are activated by positive language. And some people are activated by negative language. So negative language would be, if you don't know how to reset your state, what's most likely happening is you're having a situation in the middle of your day. You're having that derail your next meeting and you lose the deal because you still have that knot in your stomach and it's affecting your performance. Your spouse comes home for work and you are immediately snarky with them because you just got no energy to hold space. Now you've got your work impacted, your relationship impacted, and you go to go to sleep and you can't sleep because your mind is racing. So the next day becomes impacted. So all I'm doing is talking about all the negative domino. And mm -hmm. so really the only difference when we connect what we're talking about to why they should care is just asking yourself, what's the takeaway? And do I wanna talk about this in the lens of how it could positively impact their life? Or do I want to tie this to how, if they don't know how to do this, what are the negative consequences that could occur for them? Yeah. Those implications, those negative consequences that you laid out are massive. So how, how do we communicate that? Cause I mean, obviously, you know, their marketing is so, so broad that term and you have your podcast now, is it called the ambitious podcast, right? Yeah. yeah. So you guys can check that out. There's a link in the show notes to check that out. But you have your podcast now. You're on social media a lot. Social media. Uh, I mean, what social media? Does that include YouTube? Does that include podcasts too? You know, like, so it's all kind of social at this point. But and, and there's so much talk about like omnipresence. And then, you know, are we uh, putting the same video or the same image or the same post on LinkedIn as we are on Instagram and all the different platforms? Like it can be overwhelming for people. So how, how do we look at this and be like, okay, I want to share something that is about the implications. Now, how do I make that happen? Mm. Well, I kind of think about marketing as separate from social. And I'm happy that you added that okay. because marketing to me is like the message you want to deliver to somebody. So think about it almost like the package that you're going to drop off at someone's house, how it gets there could be by car, bus, limo, plane. Those are the platforms. That's just how we get the message across. So some are different experiences, right? Like if you're going to take a bus, it's going to be a little bit of a slower process. It's still going to get there. Maybe it's not as comfortable, but it's just a different experience. But the same message is what we want to get through. And so you want to have the same message because if someone finds you on any given platform, so podcast, TikTok, Instagram, whatever it might be, they want to feel like wherever they find you, it's consistent. It's like they can consistently see the same message over and over again. So marketing is really the message that they're going to get from the platform. The other being the delivery method or the platform itself is not as significant. Kind of the recommendation I give to people if marketing is feeling a little bit overwhelming for you is always think about going deep before you ever go wide. And what I mean by that is, you know, trying to have one platform, two platforms, um, even something to consider can be short form content and long form content. So like the reason I am a huge fan of podcasts is podcasts are actually one of the rare types of marketing where you have someone paying attention to you for 60 minutes uninterrupted, typically in their head headphones. And so the thing that's really interesting is when we go on TikTok or we go on Instagram, we're watching, you know, 15 second, 30 second clips. And so when we watch those, we're scrolling really quickly. Whereas on someone's podcast, we're literally, we're in your headphones, we're in your car, you're on a walk, you're on the treadmill, you're doing dishes, and you're listening to us. 
So the more time that someone spends with you, the more that they're able to build trust with you, which typically means the quicker they're nurtured. And with that, then the quicker that they convert. And so when someone says, well, you know, what's like a really good tool, I'm like a podcast, because it's someone listening to you for an hour every single week and coming back like your favorite show of like watching friends on Thursday. And so it's the same kind of idea, but with a show. And so when it comes to social, there's a lot of nuances of what it can be. And same thing with marketing, you can go down a massive rabbit hole of messaging and hooks and buyer types and launching and evergreen and all of these things. But at its simplest, basic essence, if I was going to say like the, the minimal blueprint of getting success is understanding who you are and what your values are, understanding what are the core pain points of your ideal client for the stage that they're at, not where you are, making sure that you're constantly inviting people into your world. You're not assuming that they know how to join you and putting out some kind of content consistently on one main platform where you build a deep community and connection before you ever go wide and go into, like you said, like things like omnipresence, because people typically try to go multi-platform way before they're ready. And then it ends up not really even being something that they can leverage because they're really so tapped energetically and creativity wise that they really can't get out enough for it to actually be functional. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious for the listeners of this podcast, like think, think of uh, where you guys see me. Most of you probably see me on Instagram. I would imagine, you know, I've gone through periods where I just like copy paste, copy paste to all the platforms. And I have, I don't know the last time I talked, I posted to TikTok, but TikTok was like the main one where it was just like i'm not even thinking about it just like copy paste hopefully one of these will go viral i don't even understand tiktok every now and then i do love tiktok every now and then when i'm scrolling a friend pointed this out to me because the algorithm there is so good like i'll, I'll see all kinds of deep spiritual stuff that i would never see on instagram and it's like whoa you're talking about that well that's cool right so i i do like that um although in the past several months I've gotten really good at not even really scrolling too much at all on social media, which feels really amazing. That said, I would say if we're doing an analysis in real time, because hopefully this helps people this year, I've wanted to be on LinkedIn more because I'm like, okay, my ideal client is an executive or an entrepreneur or a business owner that's interested in spirituality, maybe psychedelics, or maybe they want to bring me in to speak, something like that. Instagram, I'm not really getting that. I can get clients there for psychedelic integration coaching. That's great, but that's not like the exact space I want to play in. So what I've found in and this might be the issue, it's kind of like I've neglected LinkedIn a lot over the past five years and Facebook. So now when I go back onto LinkedIn and Facebook, like LinkedIn specifically, I have 11,000 connections, but anytime I post, I'm getting like two likes. So I'm sitting there being like, okay, I know this is like where my demographic would be, but my content's not reaching them. What would you say in this situation? Well, I think it's also recognizing that depending on what the intention is, different platforms can lend themselves toward that. So for example, just your example of TikTok, which is a great example of this. TikTok is an interest-based platform, which basically means that the only way people get content through that platform is based off of what they're consuming. So there's often like a running mm -hmm. joke that if you're really sad, TikTok's going to make you more sad. If you're wanting to be happy, it's going to make you super happy because if hmm. you, let's just say, see four or five reels that are a sad tone, kind of about like a little bit more of a, a, a less energetic nature, you're going to get 15 more of those. And then when you like those, your entire feed is going to become that. They joke about this with women in breakups, because if you go on TikTok in the midst of a breakup, you are going to be deep in it within a week because you, all of your feed and your algorithm is going to shift all of your marketing toward that. And so the reason that you went on and you saw so much content about the topic that you were looking for and that you love aliens, by the way, <laughs> yeah, it yeah. could be about anything. It could be about cake or coffee or books. Well, that's or uh, for me. It, it, it's usually aliens law of one and like, you know, uh, the deep stuff that I'm like, Oh, this is great. I eat this up. Yeah. Or maybe Bashar I, you I know. Know I'm getting aliens on Instagram. This is not okay. This is great. Yeah. 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 So when you go on, you start to realize like what I was searching for is actually here and I'm getting what I was looking for. And so that's because TikTok is actually structured 
as an interest-based platform. Whereas for example, Instagram is really targeted towards your existing community. Instagram is not really created in the way it's structured as an algorithm to push you out to new people as much as it is pushing your content out to your existing audience. And LinkedIn is very similar to that in the sense of how it actually pushes out your content. So when it comes to, for example, your audience, the other thing that I would also say, because I've heard this many times, is like, oh, my audience is not on X platform. What's really interesting though, is like, if you think about like a nine to five type of executive, when they're done their work day, their brain is fried and they're sitting on the train or they're sitting on the subway and they're on TikTok because their brain is dead. So they're on the platform. They may not be creating content there, but they are consuming content. I think that's also an important distinction because when people are looking at certain types of demographics or avatars or problems, people could also say that with TikTok, no one wants to see and hear about aliens on here. And you're like, uh, yeah, we do. We actually want to hear about this every day. So it's really thinking about if someone is on that platform already making the content of the type of person you're going for, that tells you that your market is on there. It's really just a matter of making sure that the messaging is resonating with them. And the other thing that I would also add to that is I think when we start to post on any given platform, so if you've been dead on Instagram or dead on TikTok or dead on LinkedIn and wanting to get it back up and running, there really is some initial planting of seeds that has to happen before you're really going to start to see the needle move. And so platform to platform, there's like so many nuances to each one and they're always changing. But the basis of it really being there's short win platforms and there's long win platforms. So for example, like podcast and YouTubes are usually typically more of a long-term play, meaning that there's something that requires consistency to build a community who gets super bought in on your beliefs. And over a year, two years, three years, you end up with a really thriving community of people who are on the same page as you. TikTok, for example, you could have no audience and really blow up within like a week because of how the platform is structured. And so it's also when you have the awareness of the different platforms, you can kind of use them to your advantage. So for example, for your podcast, someone may find this through a clip on Instagram and they also may be listening every week, but to take these clips back to omnipresence and put those on YouTube shorts and the long version on YouTube and put them onto to a TikTok and on a separate Instagram and all of these things, that means that one podcast just became 15 pieces of media on multiple platforms, but you're like, I still only recorded for one hour. So I don't need to go make all these pieces. They're done. So it's also back to content and the marketing and all of it, thinking about also too, how do you do it in a way that is very like sustainable for you? Because something that we see a lot with marketing is people are like, I don't know what the heck to talk about. I've been talking about the same thing for six years. And like, I'm just saying the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and that really allows you to be able to have more content without feeling like you're getting burnt out in the process as well. You know, that's an interesting piece right there about, I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over again, because I was thinking earlier when you're speaking um, kind of about that and how sometimes like, you know, we need to meet uh, people where they're at and our, our ideal clients as well. And sometimes I feel like some of the stuff that I quote unquote should be talking about, right? Uh, I'm like, well, that's, I don't really want to talk about that. You know, like I'm so much deeper in that and it can be challenging or even I, I'm working on the shiny object syndrome. Like I got that big, like a uh, entrepreneur and it's like, okay, this idea, this business, whatever, and all that stuff. But then when it comes to marketing, it's kind of the same thing where it's like, I might be talking about subconscious mind. I might be talking about the nervous system. I might be talk talking about aliens. Cause I feel like it, which I haven't talked about in a while, but it keeps coming up now. So maybe I'm being called to that. But the point being though, like, it can be very, very challenging to just uh, be like over and over and over again. But is that something that is really crucial to building your brand? So it creates that resonance with that. So with people being like, oh, Kate, Kate equals this. Yes. Yeah. People need to have a recall of what you're connected to so that when that problem comes up, they instantly associate you to be the solution to that problem. So people need repetition. And the easy example I give for this is like the fitness industry. What we all know that to be fit, we need to sleep, drink water, don't eat like a jerk and move your body. Like that's really all it comes down to. Yeah. Everyone can make it more complicated, but it's basic essence. That's what it is. 
And so when you're marketing, it's just about talking about those core things in different lenses of different experiences and stories and different ways that those symptoms come up of that problem for them and just having a different lens of how you're looking at it. So I know obviously we both connected at George's event. And one of the examples that George Bryant gives is that the package is the same, the wrapping paper changes. And that's really what marketing is. It's a matter of just constantly changing the wrapping paper to see what hits home for people at what times. And so the message of what you're going to say is probably not going to change much. You're just going to make it more relevant to the times, to the market, give examples that are contextual. So again, say, for example, for fitness, I might have different examples I give or different messaging in the summer when you're on patios and you're connecting with friends and going on vacation and all these things versus January one messaging, which is new year, new me, let's kind of hit the ground running and start with a fresh slate. The messaging during the different times of the year is going to be different, even though I'm selling the same thing. And so messaging and marketing is really about looking at changing the wrapping paper to what you're seeing. And one of the other ways that we can do that is also doing things from a little bit more of a, you know, kind of case in point or strategy lens but then there's also the other aspect of looking at it from a more emotional lens. So, you know, you can have the same message of struggling with consistency and have it be something that's connected to a super emotional montage video that kind of makes you want to cry a little bit. And you can also have a carousel that says, here's my three pillars to being consistent, which is very much, hey, go do this. And so they both make you feel different things, even though they're technically covering the same topic. And the most important thing we have to remember is that there's a lot of things that you, I, and you know, you who are listening to this hear all the time that we haven't taken action on. And that's because we need to hear it 15 more times potentially where we're like, okay, fine, you've got me, I'll do it, right? And if we only heard it one time, that wouldn't have landed. And so it's also the repetition of similar messages and similar points and values and outcomes are really what help people to get their brain down the pipeline to say, okay, I'm ready to do something about this now. And it's fascinating too, because sometimes like it needs to come from like a lived experience, like a gnosis where like we might've heard that thing 15 times or a hundred times. And for me recently, I've been talking about this concept of external family systems. I call it mirror work, not with mirrors, but looking at other people and being like, where's that within me? And a lot of people as of late have been like, oh, like projections. And I'm like, yeah. Kind of, yeah. I, it, they're like parallel, but not exactly. But point being, though, like it did help me to understand, like when someone or myself, when we're projecting by having like this massive download come through, and then it's like, oh wow, now I'm understanding it on my own level, and now I'm going so much deeper than what most people are just talking about with this thing. So it, it can just prime you, like you said as well. So that's that's great. You have a um, masterclass webinar. Webinar is it pre-recorded that people can watch, or was that like a one-time thing? It was maybe a month ago, I want to say. Oh yeah, we just have a training that we send out to people. Um, when I actually met Sam at this event. Um, we were going through a model that basically myself and George Bryant comboed together, which really is a combo of his brand and community development work meets my marketing, social media content messaging. Um, and so, yeah, it's literally just a freebie we have. There's no option. There's no any of that stuff. You literally just message us the word um, elevation on Instagram, and then we'll send you the training. And it's kind of like a download that goes over really like what we're talking about here today, but in a little bit more of a step-by-step -step format almost of like, if you were going to go from concept to post. Um, but that model was something that really is just a way to distill down all the complexities of marketing. And I'm so happy that you acknowledge that because I think that there's so many competing voices of like, you need quality, you need quantity, you need formal and, you know, polished or like be real and raw. And it's like, be personal, but then it's like, don't share too much personal. <laughs> yeah. There's kind of this, like, what the heck do I do? to see movement with marketing for your business or for your brand. And it can feel really complicated. And so it, kind of the basis of how I look at it is like bumper lanes. Like it's not about me telling you a template for a caption or any of those things. When you know the principles of the work, you'll really understand what you need to do in between those bumper lanes. Okay, cool. So guys, connect with Kate in the show notes is her Instagram and DM her 
elevation. You won't regret it. And I have my own like PDF that I'm happy to share with you guys that I made afterwards after the event. But um, yeah, it's still something that I'm still working on integrating. I'm, I have a very love hate, mostly uh, I don't like using the word hate. So love to strongly dislike, but mostly on the strongly dislike side of social media. So I'm in the current phase of uh, uh, having a little bit of a hiatus. But when I do have the that creative energy to come back i'm going to be diving into that and really coming back with a vengeance you know but i think that's a that's a, a good place to put a cap on kind of the marketing and the business side now like sh shifting into spirituality you mentioned the ice bath you mentioned different things like breath work and all that like and even alluded to burnout when would you say like your mental emotional and even spiritual connection became an emphasis for you mm. Um, I feel like, and I feel like most people in their spiritual journey will have this. It's like, I feel like it's ever evolving. Like it's just constantly never done. Like it's just never done. Um, and I think when it started, when I hit seven figures, uh, it was a big goal of mine. I don't know why it was just this fancy number. And it kind of back to your shiny object. Like for me, that was my shiny object. Like I was like, I just have to hit this number for no, if someone asked me why I couldn't tell you why I just have to hit it. I was the same. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't, it doesn't really seem like symbolic wise for me. It didn't mean anything. It was just, I had just had to hit it. I think truthfully, if I can be really honest, it was ego of just knowing that I could. Um, and so when I hit it, I remember vividly, I was sitting in my apartment on my couch, dry shampoo, my hair just excessively caffeinated. Did I shower that day yet? Questionable. I'm not sure. Um, and I was just at this place where I was like, this is it. Like, this is what success is. Like, yes, I've hit this number and yes, I've made X amount of money, but this just doesn't feel good. And I was so just burnt out. And so I really thought, I thought at that time that that was my quote unquote rock bottom, but it wasn't. Um, and so I kept going and kept pushing and I was like, okay, well, great. Like, I'm just going to keep making more money because if I make more money, then I can rest at that point when I just make a little bit more. And so I was pushing and pushing and really frankly, like I had, I want to say in total in, in my journey, like I had like three burnout episodes and every single time they got worse. Um, and it was just like seasons that would come up of me getting really aggressively sick um, feeling like I had brain fog, my body was fighting back, bloating, acne, weight gain, like just you name it, my body was just feeling it. And it's the classic thing, right? Of like, you know, the universe is going to give you the same lesson until you freaking listen. And so for me, I was just kind of like, no, I'm fine. It was just a season. It will, it will come and it will go. And I remember I talked to one of my mentors and I was like, you know, I really want to go for this next milestone. And he was like, respectfully, like you don't deserve it because you haven't mm -hmm. embodied the person you need to be in order to have that business. And until you do, like you will never hit it because you don't actually deserve to have that happen to you. And I got pissed initially because I was like, you're my coach, like you're supposed to support me. But then when I really started to take it in, I realized it was my habits and it was the way that I was dealing with stress. And it was, you know, if I was stressed out before it was Netflix and a glass of wine. And it's not that I don't, I, like I don't really drink anymore, but like, you know, having all of that was a way of me, frankly, numbing and not, as I was saying, having to tune in. And kind of back to what we said earlier, I realized like I was tuning out because I was terrified to tune in. Breath work makes you tune in and meditation makes you tune in. Ice baths make you tune in. And so every time I would tune in, it was like the emotion was sitting there on the surface. Like I would do rapid breath work for maybe two minutes and I would be a mess and I'm like, okay, this is scary. No, no, no. And I would basically like walk out of breathwork sessions because it was so overwhelming for me. And then I realized like the thing that was really the, the spark of the emotion was also the tool to solving it. Because if I could get through that hump and reframe that it wasn't scary, it was just all bringing it, you know, if it's coming up, it's coming out is kind of the, the classic line that got passed on to me. And when I heard that of if it's coming up, it's coming out, it reframes the idea of what it meant for these things to be coming to the surface. Because up until that point, I associated that to be something's wrong. There's you know, basically emotions and feelings were something that terrified me. And so the ice bath was actually something I did at a conference for the first time. And I remember going in and being in for like eight minutes because I was just wow. like, so it makes you tune in and it makes you breathe and calm your nervous system. 
And I've realized that like the ice baths for me are a jolt for me to tune into my body. And like, obviously there's softer approaches, like, you know, breath work or meditation can be a softer way to do that. But when I feel like I'm really at a place where I'm feeling super stressed, the ice bath is a, an immediate jolt for me to tune into my body. Um, and the journey from day one being burnt out till now, like these approaches and tools, the exciting part about it is they're not really difficult. Like you can do a cold shower and you can, you know, go in your bathtub and do it. And you can do breath work in your bed and in your car and pull over and just do it. Like it's all so accessible to feel so good and so tuned in. And yet so many of us, myself included for many years, I struggled with like constantly like stress and um, tightness and overwhelm and just my body like screaming for me to tune in and changing my relationship with that really changed my ability to handle the stress that's needed to scale to where I wanted to go. Amazing, amazing. And I, I love ice baths so much. For me, usually it's a cold plunge. We don't have ice baths, but I go to the gym literally just for the cold plunge, the steam room, the sauna, and the pool. And I just rotate through. And yeah, I mean, that hot cold therapy has been instrumental for me. It, so when you start to lean into these sorts of things, um, how how did that affect your business? Like, did, did you notice just some magical things just unfold or was it just like, oh, I, I'm feeling uh, more, more myself, more flow, more productive, and I'm able to perform better. So the things are coming or was it more on the magical synchronicity side? Mm. I mean, I think with the ice bath, definitely and like anyone who's done them, like you'll feel an instant jolt. Like every, if you look up the science of it, of what it can do in a day for the internal operating system, it's insane. Um, but I think for me, it was actually a lot more to deal with the fact that my emotions were coming up in times where I didn't have adequate space to process them. And that was really because I wasn't creating space to do it. Like I would be overwhelmed on a Tuesday at nine 30 and become wildly emotional about something. And I'm like, this is not a convenient time for me to need to cry is kind of what ended up happening. Cause I would have so much to do. And so I'd be emotional. And then I would be thinking about how my emotion was coming at an inconvenient time. And I didn't have time for this because I have so much to do. So now I'm feeling even more overwhelmed, which is stacking the emotion to go deeper and deeper. And so what I realized was without these tools, I wasn't taking the time and dedicating the time as a practice to do them, which meant if I didn't have time to process, the emotions were coming up when they were coming up. And so like, yes, is that still going to happen? Sure. But the frequency of how much that happened significantly decreased because it was part of a practice to constantly tune in instead of allowing your body to just say, you know what, too much, it's all coming up right now. Um, and so I think it helped a lot with regulation. And I think it also helped a lot with clarity because truthfully, I was so, you know, not to get into this whole section of things, but I was very much in my masculine. And so I used to think that clarity in my business was like me in a Google doc. Like I was like, okay, like I'm gonna open a Google doc and I have clarity of what I'm gonna do. And so I would sit there and I get so frustrated that I couldn't figure out like this problem. And then you do meditation or you do breath work and you're like, I got it. And you just have this moment of clarity. And again, it's this aspect of like, I was looking for clarity in places that really, there was nothing going to come through because I wasn't in a flow state at all. And so I found when I got more in flow state, I got more solutions and those solutions indirectly, obviously, yes, helped me scale the business. So I think the thing that I would say is tuning in made me realize like a lot of the clarity that I was looking for, I had, but I was searching for it elsewhere because I hadn't actually tuned in to ever hear it. Yeah, that that's a big one to highlight right there because uh, myself included, I think we're we all are kind of coming back to this once we have that awareness. Whether it's like going to Akashic Records channel or something like that, looking for answers or something in your business, like it's so easily it would so easy to call a friend and be like, "Hey, can you help me?" Versus sit with it and be like, "Okay, let me clear all the noise, all the distraction, all the distractions." And let me just bring it in to come back to what you're saying with like being a magnet and attracting clients. Like that's the same way we bring those ideas through and how we download them from our higher self, our collective consciousness. I'm curious, are you involved in the uh, corporate world as well? No. No. Do you have clients, friends or at all in corporate or not really? 
I have friends who have been in corporate client wise, not really. We've worked with a couple of teams that are a little bit more in that bucket, but typically mainly entrepreneurs. And your network seems like very much like personal development type, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, I, uh, how have you seen the, the, the community of personal development change in recent years? Because it seems like, you know, at least for me, when I got into spirituality in 2019, it, I realized like, oh, wow, this is like soul development, what I'm doing. And it seems like there's this natural bridge and kind of big, massive gray line in between personal development and, and soul or spiritual development. But what's your take? I think that personal development, I kind of have like a mixed bag feeling with because some of it feels like it's never done on purpose in the mm -hmm. sense of like constant, like there's always more, there's always more, there's always more. And like, what a great business to have, to have it always be more, right? Like there's always something we don't own or that we don't have access to. And so I think that personal growth is an ever growing process, but I think in it, you could probably even speak to this as well. When it comes to like breathwork and meditation, that practice is ever growing, even if the modality stayed the same and same thing with even ice baths, right? Like you can do ice baths for the next 15 years and your experience within that can develop. And so I think my kind of seeing of what I see with at least the general public around personal development is I do think it's becoming more, um, accepted. I do think it's becoming more, um, mainstream in the sense of people are more open to it. The average person we have, you know, in Toronto here, like ice bath spots that people get together and have socials around ice baths, which frankly years ago would have never been a thing. Um, and so it's exciting in that way that there are so many people who are opening themselves up to it. I do think though, by knowing the entrepreneurial side and the people who are really deep into this work is the fact that I think the mass public is being sold the surface of it when really they don't have necessarily the tools to really integrate it. And I think that's mm. the truth. Cause like, I'm sure even, you know, um, like when it comes to people doing, you know, different ceremonies and doing mushrooms and things like that, it's one thing to do that with, you know, any situation and experience it. It's another to take the awareness and the clarity of that and actually integrate it into your life. And so I think that to me is almost the line, like the front facing general public is getting a lot of like, you know, mushrooms are becoming more streamlined and ice baths are more streamlined and, you know, breath work, whatever it might be. But I think the integration of like what that looks like on a deeper level in your life, that's the missing link that I think is causing it to not necessarily be as effective. And frankly, in some situations actually be harmful. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, very harmful. Yeah. No, I'm glad you brought that up. I actually wrote a book last year, a workbook called Psychedelic Compass. That's all about like discerning if plant and earth medicines would be right for someone and just how it is the Wild West. I mean, I got a phone call two days ago from someone asking me about um, uh, getting mushrooms from me for uh, someone close to him. And he was intending on giving this person mushrooms while his friend and him were going to be drinking and smoking weed. And this was like a 67 year old man. And I was just like, that's not how it works, <laughs> but thank you for calling uh, me so we can talk about this and talk through it, you know, yeah. but it's just like, Whoa, you know, to your point, someone that's like never thinking would have never thought about it before, but been like, well, okay, let's, uh, let's check this out. Well, I guess this makes sense. Like you could break someone's psyche. And I think there's a lot of spiritual yeah. bypassing in terms of like, um, Oh, I don't believe in bad trips or bad medicine ceremonies and it's like uh, maybe yes and you know like there are certain things that we can take into consideration in turning in terms of approaching it mindfully intentionally and using our discernment and all that and then you know if, if something doesn't actually go the right way then yeah i believe like you know it's happening for a reason do I believe that everything's unfolding and happening for a reason because we go into something recklessly and we're going to learn a lesson out of that and it's perfect because it all is perfect? 
that's where I'm like, uh, that seems like spiritually bypassing. Let's be a little bit responsible here, you know? Um, but then at the same time, I, I understand that as well. So, you know, it is, uh, it is, it is interesting. All of this to say, going back to this conversation of like personal development, soul development, you brought up a really good point. And I'm trying to remember what it was that you said, um, but it kind of goes back to your journey of hitting seven figures and being like, this is it, right? Because that that's kind of that was my experience in hitting seven figures in my previous business as well, which got me on this path. And I think what you were alluding, what you said with personal development was kind of like focusing on an end destination, like we'll get there, right? And I think that evolution from personal to spiritual or soul development is the difference of sadhana, which is really being in present with the journey. Like forget about like medicine, psychedelics, ice baths, meditation, breath work, journaling, you know, smack work, whatever it might be. When we have that shift of, oh, I'm not necessarily chasing anymore and now I'm working on presence, like maybe that's as simple as the difference between personal and soul development, you know? Well, I, I think, yeah, hundred percent. And I think with personal development, the first thing they ask you is like, what's your goal, right? Oh, like yeah. what is the outcome? What's the destination? Like, why are you here? What's the outcome you're looking to have? So it's still all about this aspect of achievement instead of even to your earlier question when we started today, which was like, you know, how do you feel? And if you wanted to shift how you felt today, what would be the feeling you'd want to embody? That's more of a presencing type of question than, Hey, what is it you want to achieve? And so for sure, one of the biggest things that even to be honest, still today is like a constant challenge for me because there's a lot of annoyance, especially in business. There's a lot of goals and milestones and progress markers. And so it can be very difficult to feel present and just leaning into process and practice when you feel like there's always an outcome to be achieved. But I think it's looking at the practices you have and the processes you have are the tiny little movements every day, that compound effect that's going to get you to that outcome. Um, and so for me, I think the biggest shift was looking at what is the daily process? Like, what is the daily way that I manage my energy? What are the people that I'm around that are the sounding board for when I'm in those tough moments? How do they recenter me? Or are they kind of sitting within it with me? Are they letting me ruminate for three hours? Or are they the person who's got, gives me 30 seconds and says, okay, like, are we done now? And helps me to really figure out how to process. And so all those little changes in the process meant that when I had those moments, I started to change how I reacted to them. And by changing how I reacted to them, my solutions presented or the behavior that followed changed. And then the behavior that followed changed, the outcomes changed. And so it was really this domino, but it didn't It didn't really start with, okay, like here's my personal development blueprint and here's what I do. Cause that was also a big mistake that I made Again, in being that kind of like type A weirdo that I am, I got like a personal development. I'm like, okay, like I'm going to do this. I'm going to be tuned in. So I was like, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to ice bath. I'm going to red light. I'm going to go outside and get under the sun. So I've done all the things and then I'm going to do my day. And then on you know my break, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to read my five pages before I knew it. I hadn't even done work and I was exhausted <laughs> because my blueprint of tuning in and healing and being present was making me tie it was burning me out more than my work was burning me out and so then that became like the practice became this pressure of the outcome pressure of the markers and so I think also the other thing when it comes to like the, the reason I like the word practice is because it's not about perfection and it's not about these specific markers it's about looking at as you said the essence of how you want to feel and how what's going to help you to be present and then looking at the tool toolbox that you may have created and what tool you want to pull out today to be the thing that helps you to do that. It's it's like looking into a mirror. I mean, I've said that so many times differently, but similarly, it, like approaching our mindfulness or our spiritual routines as a to-do list and then check, 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 check. I did the same thing. And that's why I started talking about like, hey, that's that's a downfall that's a trap that we all get into when we're making this transition into mindfulness and spirituality like we're trying to do all the things it's like wait we're trying to do our way to be 
that doesn't make sense. The whole the whole idea here is like we're testing out these practices, seeing how they make us feel and if we like them or not. And then the mastery that I'm finding, you know, where I'm at now is like, OK, this is where I'm at now. Which one of these tools would work best with this situation? And right. on the same time of where I'm at now is like being like, OK, like. I'm, I'm trying to get back into like a good routine or this or that. And I'm doing my breath work. I'm doing that. I would like, like even this morning, for example, this is a great example. I was surfing almost every day for a long time there for a couple of months there, which was great for me. Cause I I'm usually like surf for a few, few times in a week. Then I'm off for a couple of months, but now it's been almost a month since I've surfed back home at least. And last time I surfed was in Malibu. Before that was San Diego. I was just in board shorts. Like, you know, it's been so cold and gray here in Santa Cruz that this morning I put on my booties. I put on my beanie, like my neoprene beanie, which I never wear uh, the beanie or the booties. And I was like, I'm geared up for this. And I looked on Surfline to like look at the waves. And I was like, all right, the waves are big, but it's a little bit choppy. It's a little bit rough and it's a high tide. I don't know. I don't know. And I was like, well, the waves haven't been good. And I asked last night and I told myself if the waves are good, I'm going to go. And there's that like type A, right? And my weird of being like, okay, I asked for this to manifest this, but I'm not really feeling it. I'm going to do it anyway. I did it. And as soon as I got out there, I was like, this was a terrible decision. <laughs> and I pretty much, I caught two and then I paddled in. Um, so it's uh, that to say your point point of it's a practice it's a practice right and just building that awareness being like okay i'm testing something new i'm going to try it out. oh now i learned something collecting data and then we can realign for the next time so yeah. well i was going to actually ask you a follow-up to that because it's been something that i feel like i've been stewing on as a question because mm -hmm. you had noted like i told myself i was going to do it and it's so, like basically you set like a goal and so then when it came time you're like well i told myself so i should do it but then you have how you felt, which is that your body was saying, I don't feel like doing it. Yep. So the thing that I've been trying to constantly figure out is if you have something that you value and that you tell yourself is your goal, typically the messaging is you push through the feeling and you do it. But then the other side is if we constantly push through the feeling and do, that's the fastest way to not tuning in how you feel. So I'm curious for you, like with your business and with all of the awareness and education you have, how do you manage that duality of like knowing when your feelings are serving you in staying where you are and not going surfing versus saying, no, that's how I feel, but I should go do this thing that even though I don't feel like I need to do it or want to do it, I'm going to go do it. This is such a great topic. I love this. And we could keep going so much longer just now that we ended up here because this is uh, great. So for me, I would say, you know, this is the practice of what I call soul life balance as opposed to work life balance and soul being the intuition, the inner world and spirituality and, and life being the more masculine energy and how we experience the world with the five senses. You know, at the time of this recording right now, Kate and I were supposed to have a podcast. I think it was two weeks ago and we both weren't feeling well and it didn't happen and we're here now. It was also a time around a full moon. And now I'm hearing a lot more people say like, oh, I was really in it. I, I'm just coming out of it. Like right before this, this period, two weeks ago, a few days before that, I was thinking to myself, man, I don't even remember what it's like to be depressed. How was I ever depressed? Like I feel amazing, right? And then several days after that, like, I just hit such a dark night. It became a crippling depression. It's hard for me to really have tears and cry. And I was crying like every day and, you know, on the couch with my ice cream and my pity party. And after about 10 days, I was like, no more. I got to get past this. I always say I give myself three days, you know, and I'm working on shortening the time. I understand I'm here at 10 days, but I got to lean into this more masculine energy and push past this because I am not enjoying how this is feeling. And what I teach is looking at like a game time mentality. If I'm learning about doing the work, now's the time to apply it. Now's the game, right? So let's go. So all of this to say, I preface it because 
that's where I feel like I was glitching this morning, but I don't know which way to go. You know what I mean? Because part of me is like, I, I want to be like, yeah, I'm not going to surf. Like I, I asked for it, but that's not in alignment. But then the other part is like, oh no, I'm trying to get back into beast mode and unleash the beast, you know? Yeah. The thing that, the thing that I kind of landed on at least so far, cause I feel like I'm kind of ruminating on it is making decisions based off values. And so I'm like, mm -hmm. if you were to assess your day, like, okay, so maybe for you, surfing is a more, a more mental thing. Maybe it's a more physical thing, whatever bucket it falls into is like looking at, if I'm not going to hit that, can I swap it? So like, if it was for physical and you're like, I just don't have an enemy to go surf today. Can we do something that is a swap that basically says, if my value to myself is to be physical in some way, shape or form in a day, can I swap it with a quick walk? And that's going to be me hitting that bucket today, but I'm allowing myself the adjustment of the feeling. So I still hit the values that are important to me to keep my word to myself but also not do so in such a way that's so rigid that it has to be this thing this way in order to hit that value. So that was the one thing that I also wanted to add with burnout that. that helped me was like making decisions based off a value system and not how you feel. Because even as I'm sure you know, within burnout or any tense business or life situation, your feelings are so like, like I've had the exact same thing where I'm like, why am I crying every day? Like, I swear I'm fine. I just, I feel like I'm going through something here. And then, then after that, three days, four days pass, like you're saying, and you're like, no, I'm fine. Like, it's just, you had that moment of a season, but the tricky part is if you act in that season based off the feeling, you mm -hmm. end up with this domino or residue of that season, even though the season is over. Or like, it's a matter of, you know, you didn't go and you didn't do the movement and you leaned into that feeling. Well, what if that feeling or state lasts for three weeks and you act in accordance with the feeling? Now you're three weeks behind on whatever it is you wanted even though you're on the other side of the feeling now. So it's been like this constant thing that I think is back to your point of kind of the, the fine line. There's such a fine line between, I think the tuning in and honoring how you feel versus the goals and like the high performance of like, doesn't matter how you feel, go for your goals. I think it's very mixed messaging for most people. So I, I loved your answer to that. So good. Yeah. And thank you for um, that analytical approach there. Like that is so good. And that's soul life balance right there because we're tapping into like, Hey, I need to be grounded. I need to get back into the doing. So let me approach this with my mind. And, you know, this is really the, the, the challenge that I'm seeing right now, because with spiritual people, you know, whether you've been on the path a long time, or you've always been identified being flowy and with your intuition, or you're someone like me, at least who was very much in the masculine, then back, like, oh, wow, it's a whole new world. And you go so far to the other side. It's like, oh, okay, starting to come back and come back into maybe not the matrix, but at least groundedness, <laughs> right? And then uh, what you're talking about with personal development and hustle culture, as I call it, all, all of that, it's like, okay, let's get out of the mind and let's get into the feeling. So, I mean, I believe more than anything, like this philosophy of soul life balance is enough to really change the way we approach our mental health and connect with one another, you know? But, no blueprint anyway. without people like yourself having book podcast all of the things so it's definitely new for people so it's good to have resources like this to be like okay new perspective aside from the constant message we've always been getting a hundred yeah kate this has been so much fun and we didn't know where we were going to take it i knew marketing i knew your journey and spirituality and we'd land there and we landed on some really cool topics guys definitely go to the show notes and hit the link for Kate's Instagram. And if you are an entrepreneur, if you are someone that's interested in a side hustle or career transition or marketing, social media, all the things, DM her the word elevation. I am going to go rewatch that myself. Hopefully tonight. No, I will do it tonight. That's leaning into the masculine. So Kate, thanks again for coming on the Soul Seeker podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Honestly, it was, it was such a good conversation. I feel like I got nuggets from it, which is always the best when you go on a podcast. So this was great. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks again.